section twenty five of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter nineteen invasion of the united provinces part two three negotiations with louis close of the french attack the states general had meanwhile on june twenty ninth submitted their fresh proposals to louis they offered him maastricht and its dependencies a portion of the generality and six millions of livres they demanded in return that their political and religious independence should remain intact louis has himself recorded his regret that acting under the advice of louvois he refused this magnificent conclusion to the war which by placing in his hands a belt of fortresses from the meuse to the mouth of the scheldt would have nullified the power of the republic to oppose him whenever he should determine to incorporate the spanish low countries with france louvois persuaded him to require in addition satisfaction to his allies the immunity of all french subjects in the united provinces from the ordinary dues and customs the suppression of every commercial edict to the disadvantage of france issued since sixteen sixty two the establishment and support of catholic churches with a payment of twenty-four millions of livres and he insisted that every year a deputation should approach him at paris to present him with a gold medal in token that they held their liberty at his grace the reply of the states-general was that to accede to such demands would be to accede to dismemberment and the reversal of their constitution the ruin of their trade and national dishonour charles the second had meanwhile rejected the solicitations of the embassy which had been sent to him also and had commissioned buckingham arlington and the earl of halifax to the french camp with power to act in concord with louis on their way they visited william at bodegraven and urged him to accept the offered terms he told them that france might have maastricht and the rhine towns but nothing more do you not see said buckingham that the republic is lost the answer illustrated the new spirit which prevailed i know one sure means of never seeing it to die on the last dyke from william the commissioners went to louis they found him willing to add on behalf of england demands for an unconditional surrender on the vexed question of the flag free fishing in dutch waters the command of the shores of zealand and the absolute sovereignty of the rest of the united provinces for william the joint demands were sent to the prince and laid by him before the states-general who returned an unequivocal rejection william would not even answer the dispatch of louis directly he contented himself with forwarding him the copy of an extract from the formal resolution of the assembly to stimulate further the national spirit he caused the dishonourable conditions to be posted on the public places of every town this uncompromising tone had been strengthened by a fresh piece of good fortune on july fourteenth an anglo-french fleet of one hundred and sixty vessels was outside the tessel Rowder, with fifty partially equipped ships could not have disputed their entrance but a curious conjunction of wind and tide long afterwards regarded as the visible interposition of providence came to the aid of the republic and before it was over there gathered so fierce a three days tempest that the shattered armament was compelled to return discomfited to the shores of england without disembarking a single man all active military operations against holland were now necessarily at an end there was not a dutch town south of the inundation which was not in the hands of the french and nothing remained for the latter but to lie idle until the ice of winter should enable them to cross the floods which cut them off from amsterdam leaving turenne in command louis therefore returned to st germain on august first a medal still harping on his favourite image was struck in his glory in which the sun was represented passing through his twelve dwellings 
pictured by the twelve principal conquered towns elsewhere the invasion had been foiled the duke of luxembourg aided by the forces of cologne and munster had made himself master of Offereisel. he next fell upon Honigen. on june thirtieth he took kuvorden and then attacked the town of Honigen itself with twenty two thousand men its fall would have led to the fall of delfsail and the mouth of the ems would have been open to the english fleet the small garrison however of four thousand four hundred men defended themselves against an incessant bombardment and frequent assaults with so much vigour that at the end of six weeks the besiegers retired with heavy loss they were now recalled from offereisel by new events four failure of first coalition against louis the alarm with which europe had been watching the progress of louis began to find expression switzerland even in her catholic cantons was so warm in behalf of the republic that it was only by force that her regiments in the service of louis were kept to their duty spain was doing her best to help the dutch defend themselves though unable yet to take the offensive while leopold though for a long time held back by the partition treaty was so alarmed by the dangers to the peace of the empire from the extension of the french power to the rhine that he formed on june twenty third an alliance with frederick william the grand elector of brandenburg by which each engaged to raise twelve thousand men at once ostensibly to preserve the peace of westphalia and the internal peace of the empire and another with the states-general on october twenty seventh by which he was to receive a subsidy on joining the grand elector in the field no peace was to be made with louis without the consent of himself and the general elector until the war finally closed louis had acted with his usual promptitude he withdrew turenne with sixteen thousand men to westphalia and placed conde with seventeen thousand to guard alsace duras was stationed on the meuse luxembourg remained with a small force at utrecht on september twelfth the austrian general montecuccoli the duke of lorraine and the grand elector effected their junction intending to cross the rhine and join william reinforced by the troops of munster and cologne from offereisel turenne drove them back to friedberg at the end of november however they succeeded at crossing at weissenau only to find that turenne had by forced marches placed himself in their path completely outgeneraled they were compelled in december to recross the river and closely pressed to retreat to darmstadt all through the winter turenne pushed them home while louvois jealous of the great captain's fame was sending him reiterated orders to go into winter quarters he gave the allies not a moment's repose and by the beginning of march had driven them across the Weser. nor did he leave them until utterly baffled the austrians had retired into franconia the brandenburg contingent to halberstadt he again established his wearied troops in westphalia william had been meanwhile endeavouring to take advantage of this diversion his first attempts on naden and worden had been foiled by luxembourg undiscouraged he suddenly threw himself with thirty-five thousand men upon duras drove him across the meuse and on december fifteenth invested charleroi but before conde could hasten from alsace to the rescue the count of montal had succeeded by a desperate attack in forcing william's lines and relieving the place the prince had no course left but to retreat in haste to amsterdam the victories of turenne now deprived the dutch of the ally in whom they most trusted frederick william utterly disheartened and tempted by liberal offers from louis agreed on june sixth sixteen seventy three to remain strictly neutral to withdraw his garrisons from all dutch towns to stay beyond the weser and to allow french troops to pass into germany to punish any infraction of the treaty of munster by fresh arrangements with the archbishop of cologne and the elector of hanover 
Louis also secured the continued occupation of Overijssel, and so deprived the Dutch of all hope of future aid from the side of Westphalia. Sweden now intervened. Fettered by fear of Denmark, from taking an active part in the conflict, and unwilling to see England without a rival at sea, she thought her engagements with Louis sufficiently satisfied for the moment by sending, in September 1672, both to Louis and Charles to offer her mediation. And in June 1673, a conference was opened at Cologne. Before the absolute refusal of the Dutch, who, as Charles complained to his Parliament, treated his ambassadors with the contempt of conquerors, and not, as might have been expected from men in their condition, to listen to the extravagant demands of the two kings, nothing could be done. In July, Sweden endeavoured to secure some relaxation of these demands. But the moment was unfortunate, for Louis was in the flush of a new success. Maastricht, after a four-week siege, had fallen before the genius of Vauban. The end of August found the Dutch as uncompromising as Louis, for they had just fought and won a desperate campaign upon their own element. Charles had in the spring made all ready for another descent upon their coasts, for he saw in a striking victory over the Republic the sole chance of extricating himself from the increasing difficulties of his position at home. He had collected 8,000 men at Yarmouth under the French general Schomberg to be transported to Zeeland, when the way should have been cleared by a defeat of the Dutch fleet. On June 7th, Rupert and Estre met Rauder and Tromp with almost equal force. The day was bloody but indecisive. The conflict was renewed on the 14th, when the Dutch fought with such fury that the English were driven back to the Thames. In the middle of August they set out again, this time with Schomberg's men on board. On the 21st took place, close to the Zeeland coast, the battle upon which hung the fate of the Republic from daylight till dark the terrible duel lasted the church towers and housetops along the shore were crowded with anxious spectators not until seven in the evening did rupert lose hope of victory then as Rauder prepared for a last desperate onset he gave the signal for retreat and the allied fleets sailed sullenly back to yarmouth william now replied once more to louis and charles the French might have Maastricht, Zutphen, and Hilscht. To England he would grant the salute, and nothing more. Cologne might retain Rheinberg, but Munster should have not an acre of land. The States General further declared that after September 15th they would only make peace in concert with the Emperor and Spain. 5. Second Coalition Against Louis Peace Between England and the Republic evacuation of the united provinces by the french william's tone was determined too by the fact that a coalition against louis more powerful than the last had now been formed spain profoundly moved by the capture of maastricht had managed to raise money to supply her army and even to subsidize leopold on august fifteenth the latter issued a manifesto to the diet explaining that he went to war to defend the empire and on the thirtieth three separate treaties were signed by the parties to the new alliance by the first leopold agreed to march thirty thousand men to the rhine where the dutch would meet them with twenty thousand by the second spain promised the dutch to join her forces to those of the empire and for a fresh guarantee of the peace of aix-la-chapelle to insist upon france restoring to the republic all her conquests while she herself was to regain the limits of the peace of the pyrenees and to retain Maastricht and Vrohoven. By the third, the errant Duke of Lorraine, who furnished 18,000 men to the coalition, was to be restored to his estates at the end of the war. Peace was to be made only by the mutual consent of all the contracting parties. Active operations began at once. William, outmaneuvering Condé, now in command of the United Provinces, captured Narden, August 28th, and marching right forward to the Rhine joined Montecocoli, who had slipped by Turenne, a little below Bun, which fell before their united efforts on November 12th. The effect was immediate. 
cologne and munster made peace the electors of treves and mayence joined the coalition but far more important was it that driven by the need of money which louis could only partially satisfy and heartily tired of a war in which he had experienced little but defeat charles after a conflict of several months yielded to the conditions imposed upon him by parliament to whom this cabal war unlike the former had from the first been distasteful and in the teeth of his engagements with louis made peace with the dutch by the treaty of london february nineteenth sixteen seventy four the republic yielded the honour of the flag from cape finisterre northwards agreed to pay eight hundred thousand crowns and granted to england the retention of all her conquests outside europe all future disputes between the rival east india companies were to be submitted to arbitration charles promised that he would give no help to the enemies of the republic he managed however to evade the recall of the english regiments in the french service and his ambassadors at cologne where the conference lingered on until the end of march remained to act in the french interest but even these defections did not fully represent the weakening of louis's cause in january sixteen seventy four the coalition was joined by denmark and in march by the electors palatine in april leopold had gained the dukes of brunswick and luneburg in may he induced the diet to declare war in the name of the empire and on july first the grand elector once more threw in his lot with the enemies of france louis at once determined to concentrate all his strength bitterly repenting his refusal eighteen months earlier of a splendid termination of his enterprise against the republic he saw himself forced to relinquish it without having wrung from her a single concession and with maastricht and grave alone out of forty large towns to represent his conquests End of section twenty five section twenty six of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter twenty the parliamentary conflict in england one the test act february fourth through march twenty ninth sixteen seventy three it is necessary now to recur to the progress of the parliamentary conflict in england the subsidies of louis the supplies previously voted and the spoil of the stop of the exchequer had enabled charles to dispense with an appeal to parliament for nearly two years these funds being exhausted and louis not being prepared to satisfy his needs he met the houses on february fourth sixteen seventy three assuming a tone of confidence he put lightly aside the question of the standing army whose dark hovering on blackheath was exciting much suspicion stating indeed that several more regiments would be necessary in the spring and he gave the usual assurances to the church then trusting to waive all attack upon the declaration of indulgence by a strong expression of his personal will he ended his reference to it by the words and i will deal plainly with you i am resolved to stick to my declaration shaftesbury followed with the famous delenda est cartago speech in which he expressed the necessity of beating the republic as being england's eternal enemy both by interest and inclination to the ground on many questions the commons were unexpectedly compliant they introduced a bill for the monthly supply of seventy thousand pounds for eighteen months for the king's extraordinary occasions thus avoiding direct reference to the war of which the country was now weary but were careful to proceed no further with it for the moment they refrained from attacking the stop of the exchequer the war or the cabal this was because they had chosen to challenge the king on one matter alone on february eighth took place the first debate on the declaration in its support the old arguments were used the advantage of trade the increase of population which toleration always promoted the folly of causing discontent at home while a war demanding all the nation's energies was at hand 
the distinction between the prerogative in temporal and spiritual matters was dwelt upon as the master of a ship may throw over cargo in a storm or one may walk over another man's grounds in an emergency so when there is sufficient occasion the king may dispense with the law can government it was boldly asked be without arbitrary government on the other side the distinction advanced was utterly repudiated granting that the king had power to pardon crime in individual cases he had none to license crime by dispensing with law the declaration broke through no fewer than forty acts of parliament repealable by parliament alone the debate closed with a vote carried by one hundred and sixty eight to one hundred and sixteen that penal statutes in matters ecclesiastical cannot be suspended but by act of parliament beyond the challenge thus thrown down to the king the debate was important as showing the distance travelled by public opinion since the passing of the second conventicle act a suggestion that the house itself should prepare a bill for the ease of his majesty's protestant subjects that are dissenters was unanimously adopted the anglican furor had evidently to a great extent passed away the commons was no longer on their defence against protestant dissent but was engaged in providing that the church of england should not be devoured by papists the vote of february eighth had been followed by an address to the king obtaining from him only an evasive request that the commons would themselves prepare a bill in the same sense as the declaration they pressed for a full and satisfactory answer and enforced their demand by a vote february twenty eighth that no one refusing the oaths or the sacrament according to the anglican rites should be capable of holding any office under the crown charles hereupon appealed to the lords for their advice they coldly replied that his previous answer referring the question to the commons in a parliamentary way was good and gracious on march seventh they joined the lower house in desiring the king at once to order all jesuits and catholic priests except those in attendance on the queen and the foreign ambassadors to leave the kingdom within thirty days to instruct the justices to execute the penal laws against them with all rigour and to call upon all officers and soldiers at once to take the oaths and receive the sacrament pressed to yield by his ministers who were becoming alarmed for their own safety by louis who saw that unless supplies were granted his ally must necessarily make peace and by the female favourites whose sources of wealth were endangered charles on march eighth cancelled the declaration to which only a month before he had declared his fixed resolve to adhere the concession was too tardy the commons were anxious to put an end to the catholic question a bill for a test act suggested by arlington to destroy clifford had already been before them on march twelfth it was read a third time in the interval it had been pointed out that if passed in the terms of the vote of february twenty eighth it might be inoperative for its purpose since the pope could grant a dispensation to take the oaths and even to receive the anglican sacrament he was however precluded from any such step regarding cardinal matters of faith the act therefore was framed to include an explicit denial of the doctrine of transubstantiation in the lords in spite of the passionate resistance of the greater part of the catholic peers under the leadership of clifford who broke out upon it as monstrum horrendum ingens it passed by a large majority on march twenty ninth it received the royal assent only then did the commons pass the subsidy bill parliament had at last won the victory for which it had been striving since the restoration james to the great loss of the nation resigned his post of lord high admiral the second part of clifford's horoscope was now fulfilled he laid down the treasurer's staff went into strict retirement and shortly died it was reported by his own hand of the disappointment of his hopes the cabal was shattered and from this moment charles abandoned all attempt to secure favour for the proscribed creed the influence of james however was sufficient to secure the nomination of sir thomas osborne soon created earl of danby to succeed clifford as lord treasurer 
an appointment which turned arlington who thus suffered a second rebuff into a keen though concealed opponent of the government meanwhile the bill for the ease of protestant dissenters had been read a third time in the commons difficulties arose only at the last moment in the lords the bishops opposed it with vehemence and secured its return to the commons clogged with unacceptable amendments by passing the bill of supply the commons had lost their hold on events charles though honestly anxious to see the measure become law adjourned the parliament and the bill was for the time lost two refusal of supplies shaftesbury in opposition peace with the dutch october twentieth sixteen seventy three through february twenty fourth sixteen seventy four the very fact that precautions had been taken against the catholics appeared to increase the general alarm much had indeed taken place during the recess to justify this feeling the test act had been largely evaded and the flaunting of papists in whitehall was evident to all louis's demand for the establishment of catholic churches in the conquered dutch towns had roused the protestant feeling of englishmen to the utmost while the national jealousy of france had been excited to a fever pitch by the belief that the conduct of estray who both in the last battle and in that of solbay had avoided giving any effective assistance had been prompted by the desire of louis to see the two great naval powers destroy each other's strength rupert in his conviction that this was the case had become the leader of a vehement anti-french party then there was the standing army under the command of schomberg a frenchman though a protestant with a declared catholic second in command and lastly the marriage of james to the princess of modena a marriage known to have been arranged in deference to the personal wishes of louis not only opened up the prospect of a long catholic succession but expressed in a definite form the alliance of the court with the french and catholic cause when therefore parliament met in october sixteen seventy three it was in a fighting mood the silencing of some leading members of the old opposition by the personal influence of the king could avail but little against the rising tide of passion the most influential members of the country party rose one after another to urge the house to refuse a supply until their grievances had been redressed here is money asked of us said lord cavendish to carry on a war we were never advised about and what we have given is turned to raising of families and not paying the king's debts lord cornbury clarendon's eldest son had begged for the king and wanted for him and would willingly do it again but he too was for refusing supply do this said another and we may deliver ourselves both from france and rome a vote was accordingly carried to refuse any supply before the end of the eighteen months assessment unless the obstinacy of the dutch should render it necessary and before the dangers from popish councils and other grievances had been removed of these grievances the standing army was first named the member who declared that these forces had not been raised for the war but the war made for raising the forces expressed the general belief passing then to evil counsellors they had just uttered lauderdale's name when they were prorogued until january seventh when the king again faced parliament he no longer asked for money to continue the war but to secure peace and this time he did not hesitate at the instance of louis to meet the great council of the nation with a gross and deliberate lie to remove their suspicions he would lay his treaties with france and all the articles of them without the least reserve before a small committee of both houses and he added i assure you there is no other treaty with france either before or since which shall not be made known the treaty which was shown was however the second treaty of dover of december sixteen seventy which in order the better to deceive parliament had been executed afresh as late as february sixteen seventy two the original treaty of june first sixteen seventy with the article providing for the announcement of the king's conversion and the subsidy from louis for that purpose was carefully concealed 
the speech we learn from lord conway who was behind the scenes was produced by the consultations of many days and nights and we are told that the king fumbled in delivering it and made it worse than in the print the fraud availed little the houses went steadily on with the work which had been interrupted they were now under guidance which rendered them doubly formidable shaftesbury had during the recess been dismissed since the cancelling of the declaration his sympathies had never been with the court probably he had been told by the disappointed arlington the true story of the dover treaty and the vexation of one who thought himself a master of intrigue at having so long been a dupe would of itself be enough to account for the immediate change in his attitude after the prorogation in the lords he organized a regular opposition the members of which met frequently to arrange the plan of attack on the day after the king's speech he carried an address for the banishment from london of all papists or reputed papists not householders or in attendance on peers the dread of a catholic succession henceforward his watchword was expressed in a vote to prepare a bill for the education of the royal children as protestants and for securing all future marriages in the royal line with protestants under the penalty of exclusion provisions equally drastic were inserted in the proposed bill for the education of the children of catholic peers the practice of sending them to catholic schools on the continent was especially to be prohibited in the commons there arose a renewed outcry against evil counsellors which on january thirteenth sixteen seventy four took a definite shape in an address to the king to remove lauderdale and buckingham from all their employments and from his presence and counsels for ever articles of impeachment were then proposed against arlington the great conduit pipe of all the previous actions of the government his defence however was so able and his friends so numerous and earnest since it was understood that he was now out of favour that he secured a majority of one hundred and sixty six to one hundred and twenty seven it was at this point that charles announced that terms of peace had been made to him by the dutch which he could accept parliament eagerly welcomed the close of the ill-starred war and the treaty of london was signed on february nineteenth the king now unable to extract a farthing from the commons put an end to the session and so to all progress with the attacks from both lords and commons the house however did not separate february twenty fourth until the habeas corpus bill with its extended provisions against arbitrary rule though it did not pass the lords had secured a permanent place in men's minds by passing all its stages in the commons and until an address had been sent up praying for the disbanding of all troops raised since january first sixteen sixty three the course of affairs in the recess was to be determined by events on the continent End of section twenty six section twenty seven of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter twenty one louis william charles parliament sixteen seventy four to sixteen seventy seven part one one campaign of sixteen seventy four the campaign of sixteen seventy four displayed the advantages possessed by a single power ably led against a coalition however extensive louis as usual was beforehand with his foes while turenne and conde held the upper rhine and the spanish low countries and schomberg faced the spaniards in roussillon louis himself invaded franche comte and in less than two months once more carried the french frontier on the east to its natural barrier the jura mountains conde meanwhile confronted the superior forces of william on the meuse and the sambre he cautiously bided his time until the prince unable to induce him to give battle began to withdraw his troops then he dashed at the rear-guard routed it at senef and captured the whole baggage train 
a second and third attack failed to dislodge william's main body from the strong position which he held and three days of terrible carnage no fewer than twenty-five thousand men were left dead or dying on the field ended with no decisive advantage the campaign in the low countries closed with the loss to france of only dunant and Huy on the meuse and grave the fighting on the rhine displayed more than ever the superiority of turenne's generalship with greatly inferior forces he met the imperialists at sinsheim june sixteenth between the rhine and the necker and drove them back across the latter river then followed during july and august the first of the terrible wastings of the palatinate on both sides of the rhine turenne was determined that the enemy should find no subsistence there and he made the whole land a desert strongly reinforced the imperialists again crossed at mayence and marched up the left bank to spier there finding turenne prepared to defend lower alsace they recrossed and reached strasbourg just in time to anticipate him as he came with all haste by the other bank having effected a junction with a fresh army brought up by the grand elector they prepared to chase him out of alsace the emergency called out all turenne's powers with splendid confidence he promised louis that if fully supported he would by the end of the year drive the enemy beyond the rhine the redemption of his pledge forms one of the most memorable feats of modern warfare for a month by a masterly use of his small force he kept the enemy from penetrating the rough country which he held on november twenty ninth he suddenly carried his whole army across the vosges to lixem near sarbourg on the western side of the chain he then with the mountains as a screen between him and the enemy rapidly traversed the whole line of the vosges from north to south picking up reinforcements on the way at the southern end where the chain bends sharply to the west he divided his army into four bodies and keeping his ultimate plan profoundly secret sent them each by a separate route back over the angle thus formed with orders to rendezvous at belfort on the eastern side of the famous bulwark of france which guards the gap between the vosges and the jura so well was he obeyed that after three weeks wrestling with all the difficulties of snow-covered and almost trackless mountains he found himself at belfort on december twenty seventh with a wearied but eager army of forty thousand men without a day's delay he swept northward upon the unsuspecting foe who as he anticipated had scattered themselves throughout alsace when they learned his retreat routed them at mulhausen drove a large body across the swiss frontier and on january fifth utterly defeated the grand elector at colmar then pushing on chased the enemy before him in confusion to strasbourg panic-stricken and quarrelling among themselves they hurried across the river and within a week from the battle of colmar turenne had fulfilled his promise not a german soldier remained on the french side of the rhine none the less louis was daily becoming more anxious to separate his enemies with the dutch he had good hopes for they had now no direct interest in the war charles on concluding his separate peace had offered his mediation and london again became the centre of diplomatic intrigue two william of orange connection with england his power in the united provinces william was at this time exercising much influence upon english politics in confidential communication with the shaftesbury cabal he had through them practically driven charles to make peace and he was not without hope that he might even oblige him to join the coalition against france up to the battle of seneff therefore he had declined the english mediation that event however and the powerful movement which was arising at home for peace changed his view conciliatory letters passed between the uncle and nephew and william suggested that he should visit the king in london but charles to gratify louis coldly declined the proffered visit he went still further though fully aware of the exasperation caused by the last three prorogations he determined on a fourth 
he was resolved to be henceforth his own foreign minister he had forced arlington to sell his office of secretary of state to sir joseph williamson who possessed no influence buckingham had been thrown over on the ground of the late vote of the commons danby by virtue of his usefulness in finding money and in manufacturing votes had under the protection of the duchess of portsmouth the conduct of all home business but of that alone concealing his intention even from him to the last moment charles announced to his silent and astonished council that parliament would not meet for business until april sixteen seventy five the effect of this master stroke as he deemed it was immediate but in a direction opposite to his hopes william in angry disappointment at once gave up all thoughts of accommodation with france he stayed all conciliatory action on the part of the states-general and induced them to refuse the proposed suspension of arms at sea and to demand not only the abrogation of the peace of aix-la-chapelle but even the enforcement of the conditions of that of the pyrenees this firmness and the knowledge of william's influence in england at once altered charles's fickle resolutions he made up his mind to bind the prince to the interests of the crown by a step which had long been discussed a marriage with mary the eldest daughter of james the first suggestion of this alliance had originally been but one of several expressions of the anxiety which arose from the childlessness of the queen the possibility of putting forward monmouth his favourite son as heir had been mentioned while as early as sixteen sixty nine buckingham had urged a parliamentary divorce and shaftesbury when in office had supported the idea charles however to his credit never seriously entertained a proposal so injurious to his wife nor did he give the slightest countenance to the scheme concerning monmouth then came the second marriage of james with its prospects of a catholic succession should a son be born nobody at present seriously proposed the exclusion of james and the alliance of william and mary offered itself as a means of reconciling the doctrine of hereditary right with the abhorrence of a catholic king charles had hitherto in deference to louis and james rejected the idea now however in spite of the remonstrances of the former he dispatched arlington and lord ossory in november to the hague to secure if possible peace between france and the dutch and the betrothal of william to mary peace it was soon found was impracticable on william's terms as to the marriage it was declined on two grounds another child was about to be born to james and if this were a boy the eventual advantage to william of such a marriage would be slight his friends in england too pressed him to refuse to associate himself with james in a way which must weaken his influence with themselves william had meanwhile been strengthening and extending his power at home the election of his adherent fachel to succeed de witt had in a great measure secured the control of the states-general while by obtaining the right of nominating the mayors of the towns which had hitherto been expressly reserved to the towns themselves he had largely annulled the republican constitution his offices of stadtholder captain and admiral-general for holland and friesland had been made hereditary while hilders and utrecht had since the french conquest been placed entirely under his control hilders indeed had offered him the sovereign name and power and he was anxious to accept it but just as when war was at their gates the people had demanded a strong executive so when the danger was removed the old jealousy of despotism reasserted itself and william was obliged by general outcry to put aside the idea in this state of affairs the approaching meeting of the english parliament excited the attention of all europe for a while it was doubtful whether it would meet at all since louis had promised charles another subsidy if he would dissolve or even prorogue it for a year and he was warmly supported by james for his own reasons but danby offered the strongest opposition that able minister the forerunner of harley in party management and of walpole in parliamentary corruption was sincerely opposed to the influence of france he had shaped a bold policy of his own 
which if successful would ruin the shaftesbury cabal at a blow a return namely to the policy of clarendon a cordial union between royalism and anglicanism in opposition to all forms of nonconformity and limitation of the prerogative he had induced the king to publish during the recess a fresh body of edicts framed in conference with the bishops at lambeth enforcing the penal laws especially against the catholics and he had spared no efforts to win over individual members of the commons the last prorogation had in his opinion been a dangerous measure a dissolution would throw the whole power into the hands of shaftesbury and his friends the navy meanwhile was rotting away for want of money which a parliament alone could give charles accepted danby's advice the more readily as the development of english commerce had increased his annual revenue by one hundred and fifty thousand pounds the only promise he would give louis was to dissolve parliament should they insist on fixed times of meeting attack either james or his ministers or meddle with alliances or terms of peace louis fell back upon bribery it was now that parliament began to earn with justice the name of the pensionary parliament english french spanish and dutch money jingled in the same pockets rouvigny had ten thousand pounds for direct bribery of members with a large sum to enable him to keep a lavish table the spanish ambassador came with full hands van boeningen took a house in westminster and exercised splendid hospitality the danish resident had a grant from the republic for the same object the shaftesbury opposition were equally ready their leader in a letter to lord carlisle had sounded the note of attack danby was if possible to be overthrown and a dissolution brought about three parliament april to june sixteen seventy five the non-resisting test it was then with a frank return to the policy of clarendon that charles and danby met parliament in april sixteen seventy five and the lambeth edicts were quoted as an earnest of the intention to regard the church in its double aspect as a protestant church opposed to popery and an established church opposed to dissent danby's wholesale corruption of the commons had so far succeeded that he was enabled to defeat the vigorous attack which was at once made upon him on the ground of his arbitrary government of the exchequer and his lavish expenditure of public money for private and family ends the court also scored a success in the rejection of a resolution incapacitating placemen from sitting in parliament so evenly however were the parties balanced and so exasperated had feeling become that it was only after a scene of unparalleled disorder following an even division when blows were exchanged and but for the promptitude of the speaker blood would undoubtedly have been shed on the floor of the house that a resolution for an address to the king to recall the english troops in the french service was defeated by a single vote from this point the commons again became impracticable the rapid progress of louis in the spanish low countries and still more the growth of the french navy roused such jealousy in england and threw such strength into the hands of the opposition that louis instructed rouvigny to offer a truce should it become necessary to soothe this irritation so pressed was charles by his own people by spain and by the republic to take measures for the defence of the spanish low countries and to compel louis to make peace that he declared to rouvigny that he was like a besieged fortress the commons took up their old position of regarding themselves as on guard against popery in france and they passed a resolution to consider no bills whatever except such as might come down from the lords danby determined to make his great effort in the upper house where he was sure of a majority the meaning of the conference at lambeth was shown when he brought forward the famous non-resisting test it was proposed that no one should hold office or sit in either house unless he had first taken the oath imposed on nonconformist ministers by the five mile act to attempt no alteration in the government of church or state the object was to drive catholic peers from the lords and presbyterian members from the commons the anglican clergy 
the parliament and the executive would then form one dominant party freed from all risks of opposition it was understood that if the test were passed the court would at once yield to the demands of parliament as to foreign policy against every stage of this audacious measure the opposition lords led with remarkable power by shaftesbury fought for fifteen days with persistent courage they pointed out that so far from the bill affording safeguards against popery any papist might as the oath was drawn take it without hesitation and they secured its amendment as follows i will not endeavour the alteration of the protestant religion now established in the church of england or of the government of church and state whether the bill would have passed the commons is doubtful but parties were so equal in a matter in which neither france nor popery was directly concerned that it was possible that stage however was never reached a dispute suddenly sprang up between the two houses on the old question of the right of appeal to the lords that which had happened in sixteen sixty eight happened again neither house would give way an inch shaftesbury exerted himself to the utmost to make reconciliation impossible the dispute absorbed the whole attention of both houses and there was no opportunity for introducing the bill in commons danby was thus at the outset completely baffled and charles was compelled in june to prorogue the parliament until october when it again met the situation was profoundly modified by events on the continent which more than ever made it necessary for louis to secure the neutrality of england four reverses of louis in sixteen seventy five secret treaty with charles the second in the spring and early summer of sixteen seventy five louis always beforehand had captured liege and limbourg and had recovered dinan Huy, and Givet. the line of the meuse was thus secured from the french frontier to maastricht while that of the moselle was blocked by the possession of treves the junction of the imperialists with the spaniards was now therefore fully guarded against turenne faced montecoccoli in alsace by compelling strasbourg to keep its neutrality and therefore to refuse the imperialists a passage across the rhine he forced them to pass into lower alsace at spire he then threw a bridge over the river a little before strasbourg and marched along the right bank into the palatinate thus getting to montecoccoli's rear his antagonist at once recrossed to contest the country between the rhine and the necker where turenne had won his former victory at sinsheim after six weeks manoeuvring turenne took the offensive intending to drive montecoccoli behind the black forest in july he succeeded in cutting his line and thus obliged him to leave the valley of the rhine and retreat to sasbach on the slopes of the black forest to the east of strasbourg here turenne came up with him as he was visiting his outposts before the attack he was heard to utter one of his rare expressions of confidence i have them now he exclaimed they shall not escape me again hardly were the words out of his lips when a chance shot struck him in the breast and the great commander fell dead end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter twenty one louis william charles parliament sixteen seventy four to sixteen seventy seven part two the effect of this blow was for the moment disastrous to france montecoccoli at once took the offensive the french retreated in disorder to the rhine but turned to bay at altenheim and fought so desperately that the imperialists left five thousand men dead on the field they then crossed the river hurriedly at schelstadt while montecoccoli passed at strasbourg and laid siege to agano and saverne the fall of which would have entailed that of philipsburg but conde flew to the rescue and these fortresses were preserved so skilful were his operations 
that before the end of the year the allies had abandoned alsace and recrossed the rhine it was his last exploit weary of action he retired at the end of the campaign to a country life in his own domains meanwhile disaster had happened on the moselle crequy had been utterly beaten before treves by the old duke of lorraine on september third and treves itself had been captured after a desperate defence the swedes too who had at length entered brandenburg had been thoroughly beaten june eighteenth by the grand elector and forced to retreat to mecklenburg their evil fortune had followed them at sea the dutch and danish fleets had inflicted upon them a crushing defeat in the baltic which led to the loss of the possessions which they had acquired in north germany by the peace of westphalia it was now louis whose thoughts were turned toward peace the state of his kingdom impelled him in the same direction the drain of war and diplomacy had exhausted the treasure which colbert had collected while general discontent was once more spreading among the overburdened peasantry armed revolt had even broken out in brittany and in bordeaux the old centre of turbulence rovigny redoubled his efforts in england to secure a french party but a french party as such he found it impossible to secure on the contrary it was clear that the next session would be of a vehemently anti-french character especially as danby himself had no love for france it could be only by assisting one or the other side in the domestic struggle that louis could hope to neutralize this spirit he therefore applied to shaftesbury and his friends their terms were simple if louis would help them to overthrow danby and secure liberty of conscience for protestants they would withdraw their opposition to his schemes this explains those closetings of shaftesbury with james which so puzzled people at the time and which established against danby a coalition of the nonconformists the catholics and louis james received twenty thousand pounds for distribution at the end of the session on condition that the english troops were not recalled nor any vote passed hostile to france but louis was bent on a still surer way of securing the inaction of england more than ever he pressed upon charles through the potent influence of louise de Kerouaille, the necessity of being free of the control of parliament by august nineteenth he had drawn from him by promise of one hundred thousand pounds a year an engagement to dissolve his parliament if it were still violent against france or refused to provide him with money thus on both sides he was safe he soon had cause to congratulate himself on his precautions when parliament met october thirteenth sixteen seventy five the request for supplies to pay the debts of the crown and to build ships was listened to with an ominous silence the reply when it came was a bill to incapacitate any one from sitting in either house without taking an oath against popery and an absolute refusal to pay the debts in view indeed of the growing strength of the french at sea a large addition of ships was voted but the intense distrust of the king was shown by the fact that besides the usual appropriation clause being passed a proposal to lodge the money not as usual in the exchequer but in the hands of the council of the city of london was lost by only seven votes meanwhile the opposition under shaftesbury's leadership hopeless of overthrowing danby so long as the present parliament continued consisting as it did largely of men dependent on his bounty was pressing in both houses for the dissolution which louis was urging directly on charles but the present members especially those elected during the reaction at the beginning of the reign had all to lose and nothing to gain by the proposal and no division was taken in the lords where james and the catholic peers supported it it was lost by two votes only foiled in this attempt shaftesbury determined to gain his ends by rendering business impossible it was easy to do this by raising the former dispute on the subject of appeals to the lords it at once became manifest that nothing else would be looked at until the lords yielded and shaftesbury took care that they should not yield 
charles was forced to close the session but he bitterly disappointed shaftesbury and his friends the practical certainty that a new parliament would consist of men still more vehemently opposed to the prerogative again won the day instead of dissolving he prorogued parliament for fifteen months to february sixteen seventy seven he then with cool audacity demanded his subsidy from louis this had been promised for a dissolution only but to louis as has been seen english neutrality was now more than ever essential that neutrality was safe if he could keep charles dependent on him for these fifteen months how accurately danby had gauged the situation is shown by the fact that rouvigny was informed that the money had been already entered in the english estimates for the coming year louis gave way without hesitation he was rewarded when in spite of all that danby could do charles further consented to an agreement that neither monarch should listen to any proposition from abroad contrary to the other's welfare or make a treaty with the dutch or any other state except by mutual consent the meaning of this latter clause was that charles was afraid lest the dutch by an alliance with louis might become supreme at sea and that louis dreaded an alliance of england and the republic against himself danby though he took part in the negotiation utterly refused to sign it declaring that his head would not be safe the king was obliged to write out and sign the treaty with his own hands the dishonesty of this transaction was flagrant ever since his separate peace with the dutch in sixteen seventy four charles had been posing as an impartial mediator in the great european quarrel and his representatives of whom temple was one were already at nijmegen the town selected for the negotiation various causes delayed the arrival of their french colleagues until june sixteen seventy six even then the conference was not complete the allies were waiting to see what would be the result of the year's campaign five campaign of sixteen seventy six the fighting of sixteen seventy six was more remarkable by sea than by land the care bestowed on the french navy by colbert and lyonne and the inducements to the noblesse to enter the sea service had borne noble fruit in duquesne france had an intrepid and skilful leader in sixteen seventy five he had beaten the spaniards at messina and had since been riding triumphant in the mediterranean at length a greater adversary Rauder, with a powerful dutch fleet appeared duquesne undauntedly faced the renowned sea king on january eighth and april twenty second sixteen seventy six he fought two fierce but indecisive contests the latter however brought upon the dutch irremediable disaster Rauder, the saviour of the republic even more to it than turenne had been to france was slain and he left no one to take his place with him passed away the last of the great antagonists with whose names we have become familiar turenne and conde tromp and Rauder, monk and rupert lyon and de witt all have gone and those who have taken their places are smaller men in june duquesne again attacked the dutch and spanish fleets in the bay of palermo and this time won a complete victory the french remained masters of sicily on land may sixteen seventy six louis with the aid of vauban captured the towns of conde and bouchain he then returned to st germain leaving schomberg in flanders and luxembourg in alsace the latter however was unable to prevent the imperialists from laying siege to philipsburg almost every one now desired peace the republic was exhausted the death of Rauder had caused deep discouragement and there was bad blood between the dutch and the spaniards that cursed race as william did not hesitate to call them the failure of william in july to capture maastricht on the one side and the failure of louis to preserve philipsburg september eighth on the other joined to the rising tide of passion in england all tended to strengthen the peace influences louis now offered to william for a separate peace terms which appealed at once to his personal and national pride 
he was to have the sovereignty of maastricht and Limburg. the southern boundary of the united provinces was to be moved so that starting at ostend and passing by ghent to maastricht it should include antwerp safeguards were to be given against future attack and william was to be supported by france in extending his authority over the republic for a while but only for a while william wavered in his loyalty to his allies he then uncompromisingly declined the proposals the coalition against louis was anticipating decisive successes in the next campaign though the congress at nijmegen was sitting a great council had been called at wesel to arrange the plan of campaign for which vast preparations were being made but that upon which they most rested their hopes was the english parliament six the war and parliament sixteen seventy seven necessity had again brought charles february twenty fifth sixteen seventy seven to face the commons so low had his credit sunk that he had been unable to raise a loan in london while danby promised him that if he would break with france supplies far exceeding what louis could offer would be forthcoming louis could only take all the precautions in his power by an ordinance forbidding the seizure of english vessels which the dutch to evade the liabilities of war were employing to carry their goods he conciliated on the eve of the session the good will of the london merchants whose influence was vast and whose opposition had been passionate he sent to courtin the new french ambassador at london eighty thousand pounds for bribery and he renewed his alliance with the whig lords james and the nonconformists to oppose danby and secure a dissolution courtin was ordered to give charles no rest every day he was at whitehall and he never left the court until eleven at night well might charles declare that he was like a besieged place a blunder of the whigs gave danby at the outset a great advantage resting their case upon a statute of edward the third which prescribed annual parliaments they maintained that by the prorogation for fifteen months the present house had ceased to exist it was easily shown that the statute did not apply and that it had been virtually repealed by the triennial act in the commons the motion raised vehement opposition for the old reasons the enemies of danby appeared now as the enemies of parliament too the result was an immediate triumph for the minister the lords declared that buckingham shaftesbury salisbury and wharton the chief movers must ask pardon of the house on their refusal they were sent to the tower and were thus excluded for the time from influencing the course of affairs danby at once took advantage of this momentary eddy in the political current with the help of all the moderate men he carried an unconditional vote for six hundred thousand pounds he next to quiet the anti-catholic feeling brought in a bill for better securing the protestant religion in case of a catholic succession drastic as its provisions were the mere fact that it appeared to sanction a catholic succession was enough to cause it to be regarded as a bill for the protection of popery and as such to awake so much jealousy that it never passed its second reading in the commons besides feeling was at the moment turned into its old channel by the alarming progress of louis who during march and april had stormed valenciennes the strongest fortress on the scheldt and captured cambrai and saint-omer while his brother the duke of orleans had inflicted upon william who had marched to relieve saint-omer a disastrous defeat at kessel on april eleventh louis's ally charles the eleventh of sweden had in the previous december gained a great victory over christian v of denmark at lunden parliament was deeply moved by these tidings a unanimous address was at once sent by both houses to the king praying for the recall of the english troops serving with france a second address on march twenty sixth repeated on april fifth urged him to declare war against france with offers of unlimited support as courtin informed louis the english would give everything for a war with france even to their shirts charles was far from sharing their sentiments to him every defeat of william was grateful not only as bringing peace nearer but as weakening the prince's dangerous influence but indomitable under defeat william was as far from yielding as ever 
his personal ascendancy had compelled the support of the states-general he had reorganized his army after the rout of kessel in july he marched with fifty thousand men upon charleroi hoping to be joined by the duke of lorraine and intending after its capture to advance right into france on august sixth he was before the town but he had not yet served his apprenticeship in misfortune the french were vigilant and active as ever louvois the greatest quartermaster ever known flew to lille luxembourg got to william's rear and so threatened him that he had to raise the siege and repass the sambre with nothing but the recapture of link to show for his labour and loss the duke of lorraine had fared yet worse at the hands of crequy leaving a strong force to oppose the duke of saxe eisenach who had crossed by philipsburg into alsace this great pupil of turenne so harassed lorraine by skilful manoeuvring and vehement attack that from mouzon he drove him back upon the rhine still following he placed himself between his enemy and alsace leaving him a while he turned upon saxe eisenach forced him to take refuge on an island on the rhine and there to capitulate without delay he returned upon lorraine who had placed his troops in winter quarters passed the rhine on november eighth and before the duke could move invested and captured the coveted post of freiburg dumieres between the sea and the scheldt had taken st guilain and louis after a campaign to which the allies had looked as decisive saw his arms everywhere triumphant william's position became continually more difficult he was now the mark for universal abuse never it was said had there been a commander who had lost so many battles and failed in so many sieges the foreign officers in the dutch service contemptuously threw up their commissions the peace party in the republic was daily becoming more confident and he thought it best not to appear at the hague his position was now saved by louis himself the dutch were indeed anxious for peace but no peace would be grateful which did not secure their great interest commerce louis was asked if he would grant the repeal of all the hostile tariffs since sixteen sixty two and a satisfactory barrier to the spanish low countries he refused negotiations at once ceased the states-general voted a large increase of the army they withdrew a demand that they had made upon william for an account of the supplies previously given still more important was it that when he announced an intention of visiting charles at london they gave him full powers to treat in the name of the republic when parliament reassembled after a short adjournment on may thirty first sixteen seventy seven the commons at once declared in answer to the king's demand for money to secure his alliances that they would give no money for alliances which were not first placed before them this was a new departure of a most serious kind foreign alliances beyond everything else had hitherto been regarded as the prerogative of the crown and parliament while exercising much influence upon them had made no direct assertion of right for charles to give way would have been to confess his utter defeat in the running fight for the prerogative which is so important a factor of the history of the reign he refused to entertain the claim for a moment and ordered the houses to adjourn themselves giving them to understand that they would not sit until winter but this adjournment left him penniless and perplexed money must be got somehow there were two ways of obtaining it from parliament by securing a peace on the continent satisfactory to the allies or by declaring war against france his efforts in the former direction soon proved abortive for since the triumphs of the last campaign louis was less than ever disposed to be moderate but charles refused to yield to danby's pressure to declare war against france he could use the english feeling to more profit than by embarking in a struggle which would simply place him more and more in dependence on parliament he had simply to take another step on the familiar road for so long as the war lasted and the temper of parliament remained the same he had an article saleable to france danby when overruled on the main question proved himself a firm and audacious bargain driver he demanded from louis july sixteen seventy seven one million six hundred thousand pounds for this he promised that parliament should not meet until may sixteen seventy eight 
and that to discourage the allies they should be informed of his intention charles was thus able to carry on the ordinary expenses of government and louis gained the prospect of nine months freedom from english interference in the negotiations at nijmegen End of section twenty eight section twenty nine of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter twenty two the peace of nijmegen part one one marriage of william and mary effect on english policy it was at this moment that william came to england on charles's invitation in spite of the fact that nothing could be less in keeping with the latter's engagements to louis the time seemed opportune for reviving the scheme of the prince's marriage with mary charles hoped that william would feel the interests of the crown to be directly his own and would thus be led to support them against his present friends among the whigs james believed that the marriage would disarm the violence of the opposition to his own accession which as the anti-catholic spirit rose was daily becoming keener by enabling men to look past himself to a protestant consort of the future queen william felt that the close connection with the english royal house must strengthen him against both his foreign and domestic troubles besides giving him a hold upon english foreign policy the wooing was therefore a short one especially as it was advisable to give louis no time for remonstrance on november third bonfires were blazing in the streets of london in honour of the betrothal and on the fifteenth the marriage took place the new influence was at once felt the feeble resolutions of charles were shaped by the firm will of the younger man and on november twenty second fresh conditions of peace which had emanated directly from william were secretly proposed to louis of all his conquests franche comte alone with cambrai air and saint omer were to remain in his hands the fortifications of philipsburg were to be raised the duke of lorraine was to be restored to the full possession of his estates vague promises were made to satisfy louis's ally sweden and he was to retain messina until that was done it was not to be expected that louis in the very flush of his triumph should accept terms which would rob him of the northeastern frontier which had so long been the object of french ambition rather than that he wrote to courton i would risk losing my own towns if my enemies which is not likely were in a condition to conquer them danby and william at once made capital of this refusal charles's irritation at his fresh failure was carefully fostered and he was easily persuaded to throw over his compact with france and summon parliament in january before it met louis made a last effort he offered an increased bribe to charles and a large present to danby and he withdrew from his haughty attitude so far as to give up his demand for luxembourg courtrai and ypres both bribes and offers were through danby's steady conduct refused not only so but on january tenth sixteen seventy eight a treaty was signed at the hague embodying william's terms and binding england and the republic to compel the assent of both france and spain ostend was handed over to charles provisionally as a place d'armes on the continent he raised twelve thousand men ordered the equipment of thirty ships and recalled his troops in the french service on february seventh confident of the concurrence of parliament he opened the session with a speech which meant war with france and he demanded supplies for ninety ships and forty thousand men but the shaftesbury opposition utterly distrusted the honesty of charles's purpose the marriage of william as brought about by danby was now regarded with suspicion they affected to believe that it was the result of an agreement with louis himself and that the king's warlike language was merely to induce parliament to give him an army which he would straightway use to secure despotic power the welfare of protestantism abroad and the checking of louis's aggression no longer occupied their thoughts 
to overthrow danby and to secure liberty of conscience for protestant dissent at home were their sole objects and for these they were ready now to render louis free of all interference from charles in fact since danby joined william they joined louis unable to oppose openly a war of which they had been the most vehement advocates they determined to insist upon conditions of peace so onerous that louis would be justified in continuing the war but if possible to render charles powerless to join it in the first part of their plan they succeeded they carried an address to the king demanding that France should be reduced to the terms of the Peace of the Pyrenees, and that no commercial relations should be held with her by England or England's allies until that was done. But farther than this they could not make head against Danby's pensioners and the moderate men. By a large majority it was voted that thirty thousand men and ninety vessels should be raised to support the alliance with the Dutch, and on February 18th, a resolution to raise a million sterling to enable his majesty to enter into an actual war with the french king was agreed to two capture of ghent and ypres by louis proposals for a separate peace with the dutch the suspicions of charles's honesty were as usual well founded unable from habit even if willing to take a great resolution though one in which the whole nation would have supported him the king now secretly made a fresh attempt to accommodate matters with louis by offering the alliance of england for six hundred thousand pounds on condition that louis would give up valenciennes and his other conquests on the scheldt but louis was less than ever disposed to yield for he had just struck another unexpected blow he was determined to extort peace as de witt had extorted it by the chatham exploit sending crequy across the rhine to oppose the germans he ostentatiously made preparations which seemed to threaten ypres mons namur and luxembourg the spaniards hurriedly drew troops for their defence from all the towns where no attack was anticipated among them the great city of ghent suddenly louis concentrated his forces and appeared before ghent on march fourth having previously ordered Dumieres to meet him there with his corps. Denuded of its defenders, Ghent was in his hands by the twelfth. Repeating his stratagem, he threatened Bruges, and when the troops from Ypres were drawn off to its succour, he invested and took that fortress on the twenty-fifth. The effect upon public feeling in England was such that Charles, to keep his people within bounds, was obliged to send troops to ostend while privately assuring the french ambassador that he had no desire for war and would do all in his power to avoid it he was in a pitiable state of perplexity afraid of the popular outcry but unwilling to commit himself to war he went on with his vain endeavours to find a compromise satisfactory both to louis and william his difficulties were increased by the state of things in the united provinces there too the union of william with the english royal family was looked upon with the keenest suspicion which was further increased by the discovery of a secret article in the treaty of january binding charles and the states-general to assist each other against their rebellious subjects a discovery which prevented the ratification of the treaty upon the republic therefore the capture of ghent and ypres had the effect which louis had intended now that their own independence was beyond question and that he declared himself willing to satisfy one of their essential demands by abandoning to spain a strong barrier for her low countries the dutch thought only of their other great interest commerce which was every day passing into the hands of england the states-general represented to william the necessity of a separate peace and they went the length of disbanding a third of their army louis informed of this disposition at once furnished his deputies at nijmegen with instructions always scrupulously faithful to his allies he in the first place insisted on full satisfaction to sweden of his conquests in the empire he would retain only freiburg or philipsburg in other respects the peace of westphalia should be scrupulously observed to spain he would concede a barrier extending from the sea to the meuse guarded by nieuport dixmude courtrai audenarde at 
Mons, Charlois, and Namur, retaining Ypres in his own hands. To the Dutch he offered Maastricht and the most favourable commercial relations. Partial restoration was promised to the Duke of Lorraine. If these terms were promptly accepted, he would throw in either Charlemont or Dinan and Bouvines. A violent conflict went on in the provinces. Led by Amsterdam and the principal towns of North Holland, the merchants clamoured for peace. Against them were Temple and William, who were supported by the whole body of nobles. The prince hurried to the Hague and spoke vehemently against so shameful an abandonment of his allies. In the end, all that the peace party could do was to secure from Louis a three months truce with a removal of commercial restrictions and the sending of a pacific mission to England and Brussels. Meanwhile, the news of their action had reached England. Charles evidently saw in it an excuse for withdrawing from his forced connection with the Republic. He laid the matter before Parliament, April 29th, in a tone of anger at such a step having been taken without his consent and requested its advice. At the desire of the Commons, he placed before them the various treaties he had mentioned in his speech. After several days of eager debate, a resolution of the most uncompromising character was carried by a narrow majority. The king was desired at once to join the coalition for carrying on the war, to secure the continued cooperation of the Republic, to obtain the consent of all the Allies to a total prohibition of any commercial relations with France, to invite further assistance, and to secure a promise that no peace should be made without the consent of all. To this vote, so different from what he had desired, Charles made no reply, on the ground that the Lords had not concurred. But on May 11th he sent a message warning the Commons that unless a supply were speedily given him, he should be forced to lay up his ships and disband his troops, the very step to which the Shaftesbury party, in fulfilment of their pledge to Louis, were now bent upon driving him. The message raised a tempest in the house. As Colonel Birch said, this is a work of darkness from the beginning. But so well had Danby marshalled his forces that the court secured a majority of one against continuing the discussion. He was unable, however, to prevent a general resolution against the whole conduct of affairs, praying especially for the removal of Lauderdale and other evil counsellors. Charles at once prorogued the Parliament for ten days. 3. Secret Treaties of Charles with Louis the disbanding question in Parliament. The truce offered by Louis with the suggested terms of peace had in the meantime been submitted to the other members of the coalition. By one and all they were rejected in language of the utmost defiance. Louis therefore again set himself to secure a separate peace with the Republic, but he lost no opportunity for strengthening his own position. Assembling a strong force at Courtrai on May 16th, he crossed the Lys and from the little town of Daints, close to Ghent, wrote a conciliatory letter to the States-General. For a time, William, supported by the nobles, and now by some of the towns, though not by Amsterdam, stood firm against any compromise. His resolution, however, was changed by unfavourable news from England, and he consented to a deputation being sent to confer with Louis. The belief of Birch, that the whole matter was a work of darkness was fully justified. Charles had been again in secret negotiation with Louis, who had offered him two hundred and forty thousand pounds in the course of three years, should he succeed in bringing about a peace. But Danby, who was determined that if England was to be at the back of France, it should be for a good price, demanded that sum yearly for three years the payment to begin at once. Louis decided to meet Charles halfway. On May 27th, by a secret agreement drawn up and signed by Charles alone, for Danby again refused to put his head in peril by adding his name, it was arranged that Charles should do his best to secure peace on terms favourable to Louis within two months, that if unsuccessful, he should recall and disband his troops, except three thousand to be left in Ostend, and should prorogue Parliament for four months on condition of receiving the subsidy demanded, half of which was to be paid at the expiration of the two months. The suspicions of the commons again tended to reduce Charles to the powerlessness which Louis desired. On the very day of the compact, May 27th, they demanded either immediate war with France or immediate disbanding. 
a week later after two similar votes they insisted that the disbanding should take place by the end of june though they afterwards altered the date as regarded the forces in the spanish low countries to july twenty seventh and they provided money for the purpose they gave him too a further supply for other uses after rejecting without a division his request for an increase of three hundred thousand pounds to the revenue when however the lords endeavoured to extend the date they at once repelled the assumed right of the upper house to meddle with a bill of money by tacking the bill to raise funds for disbanding on to that for further supply so that they must both fall or pass together charles having passed the bill prorogued the parliament on july fifteenth he had an excuse more than sufficient in his eyes for evading the engagement to disband for the whole aspect of affairs abroad and with it his intentions had again undergone a complete change up to the end of june peace with the dutch and spain had seemed assured william himself regarded it as useless to struggle any longer against the universal cry he wrote a conciliatory letter to louis which was answered in the tone befitting an injured father to a repentant son the states-general ordered their deputies to sign the treaty before the end of the month and spain expressed her concurrence only at the last moment a misunderstanding suddenly declared itself which threatened an immediate renewal of the war on the part of every nation engaged End of section twenty nine section thirty of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter twenty two the peace of nijmegen part two four expected renewal of war another treaty of england with the dutch separate peace between louis and the dutch in promising to give back to spain the towns which were to form her barrier louis had avoided pledging himself to do so as a preliminary to peace though this was understood by the dutch and the spaniards he now demurred to giving them up until the demands of sweden should be satisfied this would have compelled the dutch to maintain a large army on the isle when their greatest desire was to disband in a moment the provinces were in a blaze and william regained his ascendancy though every one now longed for peace the fortunes of war had been so evenly balanced that any unexpected pretension on one side or the other was sufficient to throw all into confusion charles underwent the same revulsion of feeling he refused to ratify his secret treaty with louis or to disband his troops in the spanish low countries declaring that his people would chase him from his kingdom if louis were suffered to extend his conquests he sent off temple once more july sixth in haste to make a strict alliance with the republic and on july twenty sixth a treaty was framed binding the dutch to continue the struggle and england to declare war if louis by august eleventh did not declare himself ready to give up the town at once louis had thus fifteen days wherein to settle the question upon which depended the breaking up of the coalition or the immediate renewal of war day by day the interval passed without an answer from louis he could not bring himself to break through his rule of fidelity to his alliances at length he was set free by the action of the swedes themselves one of their deputies took upon himself to declare that sweden would raise no objection to a separate peace if the republic promised not to assist her foes louis thereupon ordered the treaty to be signed on condition that spain should make a similar engagement regarding both himself and his allies this demand led to further delay and on the ninth within a day of the stipulated time all was still in doubt when at ten on the next morning they met for the last conference the french commissioners colbert estrade and avaux felt how vast were the issues depending upon that day's work carefully as the exhaustion of france was kept from the knowledge of europe they knew that the continuation of war would be a terrible calamity for their country and that louis haughty as might be his language had probably reached the limits of what it was possible for him to conquer at the time 
they knew too the temple had arrived the evening before at nimehen to frustrate if possible in concert with william the conclusion of peace for thirteen hours the conference sat continuously colbert and his colleagues fought the ground inch by inch against the settled will of william and the states-general only one hour before the moment at which negotiations would cease at eleven on the night of august tenth sixteen seventy eight france and the republic signed the treaty which removed the most important member from the coalition and gave the signal for its disruption by this treaty louis confessed afresh the complete failure of his war of aggression on the dutch the patient republic came out of the six years struggle without the loss of an acre of land the sum of her concessions was a promise of neutrality during the remainder of the war untouched in their territory the dutch were also secured in their main interest commerce freedom of trade and navigation were mutually restored and the compulsory visitation of the warships of either nation in each other's harbours removed while all vexatious restrictions on dutch subjects residing or trading in france were taken off each might henceforth trade with the enemies of the other if properly provided with a passport except in articles contraband of war or in the language of international law a free ship was to cover the merchandise but all goods on an enemy's ship should be liable to confiscation the personal interests of william were provided for by the restoration of his principality of orange and of all the estates belonging to him in france franche comte the charolais and the spanish low countries spain and any other of the allies who within six weeks from the ratification should declare themselves ready to accept peace were to be admitted as parties to the treaty strange to say the peace was signalized by the most desperate engagement of the war william with all the forces he could collect had marched to succor mons then invested by the duke of luxembourg on august fourteenth he arrived before the french lines luxembourg knew that peace was concluded william had certainly no official knowledge but the probability of events must be set against his emphatic declaration that he had no information whatever he determined to strike one more blow at louis and if possible to destroy his own unbroken record of defeat in the field by an impetuous attack upon luxembourg's lines he for a while carried all before him but the hunchbacked dwarf rallied his forces and delivered so fierce a counterstroke that after six hours of murderous conflict he regained the captured positions at the close of a long day of slaughter luxembourg still held mons in his grip while william though he had failed in his main object remained on the field of battle the next morning the official declaration of peace arrived and at the same hour by arrangement the two armies left mons the french retreating toward at the dutch to brussels five peace with spain the treaty was not binding until it had been ratified to prevent this ratification william and temple strained every nerve they were supported by the indignant reproaches of the allies whom the republic had thus deserted denmark brandenburg the emperor and the bishop of munster spain too put obstacles in the way the states-general hereupon adjourned the ratification until the peace with spain was signed acting meanwhile as mediators but the internal troubles of spain robbed her of all real desire to continue the war the boy king charles the second had assumed the government at the age of fourteen on november sixth sixteen seventy five but the power remained with the queen regent she in turn delivered it into the hands of fernando valenzuela a worthless favourite of the type of piers gaveston or robert carr a rise of the nobles took place in consequence and the king's natural brother don john came into power though charles remained nominally king the favourite was banished and the queen fled 
though john in turn soon found himself in the midst of difficulties and was anxious to be free from the additional complications of the war louis informed of the activity of the emissaries of william who were inveighing in every town of the province of holland against the dishonour brought upon the nation and of the mission of lawrence hyde from the king of england with an engagement to declare war three days after he knew that the states-general had refused to ratify the treaty determined with his usual good sense not to endanger the advantages he had acquired on september seventeenth the peace was signed with spain france gave back charleroi binch at audenarde and courtray which she had gained by the peace of aix-la-chapelle the town and duchy of Limbourg, all the country beyond the meuse ghent rodenhuis and the district of the vaise leuze and saint ghislain with pouge cerda in catalonia these having been taken since that peace but she retained franche comte with the towns of valenciennes bouchain conde cambrai and the cambrai air saint omer ypres vervic varneton Poperinga, Bayeul, Kessel, Bavai, and Maubuge. The signature of this treaty was followed by the ratification of that with the Dutch. The Spaniards, however, with their ingrained love of delay, attempted, when the date came, October 31st, for the ratification of their own treaty to put it off until that with the Emperor was signed. Louis held his hand for a month, then thoroughly provoked, he ordered his troops to march upon brussels this brought the spaniards to their senses and on december fifteenth the ratifications were exchanged six peace with the emperor and the rest of the allies there remained the grand elector of brandenburg and the king of denmark the dukes of brunswick and luneberg the bishop of munster and the emperor the two first whose operations were chiefly against sweden at the point farthest from louis and who were gaining successes there did their best though now deprived of the subsidies of the united provinces to prevent the emperor from coming to terms with france and sweden he however had conclusive reasons for wishing to make peace he had in the last campaign seen the young duke of lorraine thoroughly beaten by crequy who besides preventing the capture of freiburg had taken kehl ruppelschau landau and lichtenberg and had destroyed the bridge at strasbourg the hungarians too had risen against him and with the support of bodies of troops raised in poland and officered by frenchmen had gained alarming successes on the border on february second sixteen seventy nine peace was declared between louis the emperor and the empire louis gave back philippsburg retaining freiburg with the desired liberty of passage across the rhine to breisach in all other respects the treaty of munster october twenty fourth sixteen forty eight was re-established if the enemies of sweden would not make peace the emperor and the empire would neither assist them nor allow them to encamp on the territory of the empire outside their own dominions while louis should be free to keep garrisons in several towns of the empire the treaty then dealt with the duke of lorraine to his restoration louis annexed conditions which rendered lorraine little more than a french province not only was nancy to become french but in conformity with the treaty of sixteen sixty one louis was to have possession of four large roads traversing the country with half a league's breadth of territory throughout their length and the places contained therein the roads namely from saint dizier to nancy and from nancy to alsace vesoul in franche comte and metz the town and district of Longui also were to be placed in his hands to these conditions the duke refused to subscribe preferring continual exile until the peace of reichweg in sixteen ninety seven when at length his son regained the ancestral estates on the same day the emperor and the empire made peace with sweden all that the allies had taken from her was to be restored and the emperor agreed to mediate between her and the powers that still stood out it was impossible for the other members of the coalition to carry on the war the dukes of brunswick and luneburg 
the bishop of munster surrendered their captures in sweden retaining one or two places which rectified their frontiers each received from louis a subsidy for the concession it needed however a final exhibition of force before brandenburg and denmark would give way crequy again passed the rhine and took mark and liebstadt then crossed the weser defeated the grand elector and threatened magdeburg on june twenty ninth the grand elector consented to make restitution to sweden except on the brandenburg side of the oda promising to build no fortress on that river denmark left alone made peace with france and sweden in september on similar terms and separate treaties were also concluded between sweden spain and the republic the dutch who in accordance with the treaty of sixteen seventy three should have restored maastricht to spain retained that important bulwark as a recompense for their efforts in securing the barrier for the latter country seven conclusion the effect of the peace of nijmegen was thus speaking generally to reaffirm the peace of westphalia but inasmuch as louis though foiled in the immediate purpose of the war was the only gainer it did not like the peace of westphalia close for any length of time the sources of strife but while affording to france a basis for future aggrandizement left sore feelings everywhere with the certainty of renewal of war one country alone or rather one person had come out of the struggle with marked discredit the position of charles the second of england was indeed contemptible peace had been made without his concurrence in spite indeed of his utmost efforts he had lived by chicanery and his chicanery had ended in complete discomfiture louis now neither needing nor fearing him met his appeal for part at least of the money he claimed with a contemptuous refusal in december sixteen seventy eight the lords united with the commons in insisting on his immediately disbanding his troops and from that moment baffled in diplomacy and crippled for war he had no further voice in continental affairs his position with his own people was as humiliating as his position in the face of europe to the parliament and to the church he was an object of suspicion his supplies were doled out with jealous parsimony and his use of the money was vigilantly watched from the control under which he fretted his only chances of escape had been trickery and foreign alms his servants were indeed capable but bitter personal rivalries prevented all cooperation and though the extravagances of an opposition as unscrupulous as himself aided by his own coolness of head and cynical good temper afforded him before long an opportunity for establishing an apparently complete ascendancy in his kingdom it was an ascendancy maintained only by a scrupulous observance of conditions which he had now for nineteen years in vain endeavoured to evade the picture is heightened by contrast louis stood before europe upon a pinnacle of glory how he had used the instruments of ambition by which he found himself surrounded at the close of the wars of the fronde the renowned commanders the veteran troops the skilful diplomatists the great administrators among whom he stood the adored and unquestioned chief how with the people contented to be at length freed from the desolation of civil war and a treasury soon overflowing through the genius of colbert he had leaped at two bounds to a position which made him at once the admiration and the terror of europe how he had created navies and had sent out his armies north south and east to confront all europe in arms how he had defeated coalitions dictated treaties of peace pensioned kings and governments how he had not only baffled the jealousy of england but had even enlisted the might of her crown in support of aggressions which her people hated all this we have seen and like that of charles his european position was reflected in that which he held at home to his own people he was as a god his marshals and his armies knew no will but his word his ambassadors in every court carried out his commands with unfailing obedience after twenty years of imperial almsgiving and of war his treasury still to ordinary observers seemed overflowing to such purpose had he depressed the haughty noblesse of france 
that they who had been the rivals of the throne were now content to worship from the level of a common servitude all great offices the names of which recalled the days when the monarchy was still under restraint constable admiral and lieutenant general were suppressed and the rest he took so literally into his own hands that in 1681 he put them up to public auction. With the aid of the Jesuits, he defied the papacy, and over the church his rule was absolute. For every form of intellectual effort, France was then famous. Religious oratory, science, art, history, literature, and one and all were devoted to the glorification of the king. And yet, at this very time, there was not far distant the happy combination of events which was to place a final check to his ambition in the breast of william of orange there glowed ever more intensely that unquenchable hatred of france which had received its last and fiercest expression in the desperate onset upon luxembourg's lines before mons within ten years he once more arrayed europe for the conflict but this time with a mightier following at his back england at length took her rightful place the man who in his own person represented the spirit of continental opposition to the aggressions of louis and the opposition of the english people to the french and popish policy of their own kings found himself enabled to let loose the hatred which thwarted so long had grown ever keener by repression the happiest day of william's life was probably that on which as king of england he declared war against France. On that day began the long and terrible course of retributive humiliations, which at length struck his lifelong antagonist to her knees and brought upon the great monarch an old age embittered by disappointment and care. End of section 30. Recording by Pamela Nagami in Encino, California, July 2018. End of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth from the Peace of Westphalia to the Peace of Nijmegen by Osmond Airy.